So we're not going to delay much further. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce as our first speaker to open the event, my partner in crime and fellow national embarrassment and disgrace from the <laughs> European Parliament. He doesn't need a further introduction, but uh, my colleague Nick Wallace MEP. Well, the truth be told, uh, I think most people would agree that I'm a bigger embarrassment and disgrace even than Claire. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I, um, I, I normally, I prefer, I generally prefer to, to talk without notes, but I'm actually going to uh, read something today that we have prepared. Um, anyway, it's, um, it's powerful uh, that there's uh, such a crowd here uh, on the day that's in us um, to give support to the whole peace and neutrality uh, movement. That, and it is developing into a movement. Uh, myself and Claire spoke at protests in Cork and Galway um, in the last couple of days. And I think the people are really, um, have been, are waking up to what's happening. And uh, I think the Irish people are, in a very different place to our political class who are uh, working in the interests of elites that do not benefit you in any way. Anyway, the current crisis has been used by the Irish media class and a handful of politicians to make the case that Ireland should relinquish the neutrality enshrined in our constitution and even commit to joining NATO. Naturally, these jingoistic sentiments are from those too old to enlist, their children and grandchildren too well off to endure the bad pay and conditions our defence forces do. Ireland's tradition of neutrality is born out of an unwillingness to kill and be killed in imperialist wars that have nothing to do with our people and everything to do with the interests of the elites profiting from arms, fossil fuel and finance industries that just happen to own the media calling for media or for military escalation today. Ireland is one of the few EU countries that has not been directly involved in NATO's war crimes and atrocities. And we do well to hang on to that badge of honour and use the credibility and goodwill that comes with that honour to facilitate diplomacy, de-escalation and peace. European leaders and the EU High Representative Joseph Borrell tell us that we have to enter a war economy and that increased military spending and arms production are the only way to defend peace and to protect European citizens from future threats, including the threat of climate change. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has been milked by the militaries to serve as a justification for acceleration in this area, but the plans for expanding EU militarism were already well on their way. The European Defence Agency, PESCO, the European Defence Fund, the European Peace Facility, the joint EU missions, the battle groups, the rapid response force, the strategic compass, and the European External Action Service were either in place or planned prior to the war. The Fianna of all dominated governments that presided over force-feeding the Irish public with the Nice and Lisbon treaties mocked claims by the opposition that the treaties would bring us closer into an EU army and into NATO. Former Commissioner <laughs> President Claude Junkers, on the other hand, described PESCO, which was activated in 2017, as the sleeping beauty of the Lisbon Treaty. In 27, that same year, the then High Representative Federico Mogherini called PESCO the definitive leap forward in European security and defence, the foundation stone of a future European army. The Dáil pushed through approval of Irish participation in this armed forces integration mechanism with a two-hour debate and vague threats that if we didn't sign up, our interest in Europe would be jeopardised. Back then, the Taoiseach told me in a debate in the, in the Dáil that the erratic behaviour of Trump and the fallout from Brexit meant the EU had to forge its own way on defence. Today we're told the war in Ukraine shows us we should prepare for more war. There is always a reason to invest in war. There is always a threat around the corner when there is money to be made, careers to boost and lives to expend. Defending the expansion of PESCO military projects last July, Minister Simon Coveney again rejected the notion PESCO was a Trojan horse 
for an EU army, as well as the idea that it could endanger the concept of military neutrality. A concept that has appeared out of nowhere and that in practice does not quite stick with the parameters set out in Article 29 of the Constitution. We are constitutionally committed to peace and friendly cooperation amongst nations, the Pacific settlement of international disputes, and the generally recognised principles of international law. How does that sit with allowing a foreign power, arguably the most blood-soaked in human history, to set up a forward military base on our sovereign territory in order to facilitate illegal wars that have killed more than a million people? EU High Representative Borrell is very often refreshingly candid about what has been going on in Brussels and other centres of European power. At a recent Security and Defence Committee session, he said that the war had given the European Defence Agency a new lease of life. They were now able to speak to the defence industries on behalf of practically all member states. That geopolitical Europe was now a reality. As we have imposed massive sanctions and have trained tens of thousands of Ukrainian troops. He confirmed the rapid deployment capacity is on track to be operational by 2025. That is, an EU army. Burrell went on to clarify the difference between the EU battle groups and the rapid deployment force. He said that the battle groups never got off the ground, that they were not adaptable enough to, for unforeseen missions. The rapid deployment force, on the other hand, will be made up of pre-designed forces that are deployable for all kinds of different missions, though through various modules that can be made available and can be grouped together and can be disbanded and regrouped. He goes on to say, and soon, why not? We would have to envisage combat operations in what he calls non-permissive environments. Burrell is clearly describing an EU army heading off to war at the drop of a hat. He has in the past complained about the indecision and difficulty of getting all member states on the same page on geopolitical issues. That we were not able to act fast and punch above our weight as a geopolitical power on the international stage. Michal Martin has been questioning whether Ireland's triple lock system on defence matters is fit for purpose. He's talking about getting rid of the conditions that must be met before Irish defence forces can be deployed overseas. A UN mandate and consent of both government and cabinet in the Dáil. He is accelerating the destruction and undermining of the United Nations, a forum that, while not perfect by any means, is in theory wedded to the worthy principles contained in the UN Charter. We need at this time to strengthen global institutions like the UN, and every country should honour the treaties they have signed. President Michael Lee Higgins was emphatic about this in his interview, criticising the drift towards NATO last week. He said the decline of the UN was an incredible failure of diplomacy, and that the future of the UN lay in the countries of Africa, Asia and South America, rather than Europe, because some of its principal partners are too heavily involved in undermining it. You can imagine the media response. The triple lock mechanism is not even an adequate failsafe in some respects. Peacekeeping missions are not covered, and the Council of the EU, the body that approves and implements EU overseas missions, is a political body. It's a secretive round table of increasingly right-wing ministers. Whether it's peacekeeping missions or sanctions package, they don't follow anything like due process, evidence is not presented, and accused parties do not have, do not have the right to present a defence. Sanctions packages are bandied about like confetti, killing tens if not hundreds of thousands of people, and it's because of these politicians handing down judgments based on hearsay and articles in the corporate media. The rule of law has been thrown out the window, has been replaced with the law of the jungle. Mali, where Ireland has had troops stationed for 10 years, 34 for about five years, now eight remain, is a case in point. The EU military presence in Mali and the broader Sahel has not been benign. It has been designed to advance EU and member states' interests such as access to resources and policing migration flows. You'll probably know that France gets 50% of its uranium from Niger, and 75% of French electricity comes from nuclear. We're down there to protect French access to cheap uranium. It has been underreported, but the mission has been an unmitigated disaster with shocking consequences for local populations and knock-on effects on regional conflicts. In discussions in Brussels, African countries are now increasingly seen as places for the EU to engage in geopolitical contests with Russia and Chinese interests. And EU missions are considered strategic assets in these contests. The training mission in Mali, approved by the Council of the EU, barely has any basis in international law. 
It was requested by a government that had emerged from a coup that clearly did not exercise comprehensive control over the territory. In effect, the EU's military training mission is a massive foreign participation and was referred to under international law as a non-international armed conflict, in other words, a civil war. None of these facts seem to bother the Council of the EU or the Irish government either, for that matter. The point is that the way the Council of the EU behaves, the frankly neo-colonialist agenda the EU is pursuing in its southern and eastern neighbourhoods, and the EU is now almost complete subservience to the diktats of the US and NATO since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the triple lock is not near enough to safeguard Irish neutrality. The EU is creating an army. The member states have committed themselves to growing the defence expenditure to 70 billion euros by 2025 that will bring the annual EU spend on military and weapons technology to 284 billion per year. And perhaps most worryingly, there are many EU leaders happy to pick sides in the great power competition and instability arises out of the emerging multipolar global contest. It is precisely at this time of global divisions and the formation of camps that we need more neutral states to act as intermediaries, to use positions of impartiality and good faith to facilitate peace and international agreements. To return to President Higgins, he hit the nail on the head last week when he said that any time that Ireland puts itself behind the shadows of previous empires within the European Union, it loses an opportunity of expanding and enhancing and using its influence for the world. What is really upsetting about all this talk of abandoning neutrality is that our government would have to join the political West Bloc, the imperialists, the colonialists, the ones still pushing around the bleeding dry the global South countries, starting wars, coups, and implementing murderous regimes, regi sanctions regimes. What further proof do we need that the Irish Revolution remains unfinished when we have subservient compradors like these representing us on the international stage? What further proof do we need of the vital importance of neutrality for Ireland? What further proof do we need how important it is now that we stand up and we fight the bastards? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>